From Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American original. For over two decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. If, for such a small word, it packs a wallop. If I live to 100, if Social Security isn't enough, if my heart gets broken, if she says yes. We believe if should never hold you back. If should be managed with a plan that builds on what you already have. Together, we can create a personal safety net, a launching pad for all those brilliant ifs in the middle of life. You can call on our expertise and get guarantees for the if in life. After all, we're MetLife. When you meet our people, understand their vision, the spirit of self-reliance, and legendary can-do attitude. It won't surprise you that so many world-class companies are proud to call Mississippi home. Visit Mississippi.org to see what we can do for you. Issue 1. Republicans 100 days. Uh, there's no question, but the last couple of election cycles were not good to us. Not good. Not good. Try lethal, Mitt. And now Republicans are reeling, and the defection of a GOP Amenance Grease, Senator Arlen Inspector, has turned a floodlight on the Republicans and their misery. What percentage of voters is Republican? Eight years ago, it was 37%. Now it's 31% a drop of almost 1% per year. When voters are asked whether they are liberal or conservative, 35% say conservative. But of that 35%, two out of five will not let you call them Republican. They are conservative, and that's it. How serious is this? Are the Republicans in danger of extinction? Well, it wouldn't be the first time. In 1787, the year the Constitution was ratified, the Federalists, were a powerhouse. Within four decades, they were gone. The Whigs. The Whigs were founded as a party in 1833, about 30 years before the Civil War. The party lasted for about 25 years and disappeared altogether by the Civil War. Other parties have come and gone. The Populists, the Progressives, the Anti-Masons, the Liberty Party, the Democratic Republican Party, the Know Nothing, etc., but the Republicans? Republicans say they aren't going anywhere. Questions, are Republicans toast for good, or will they stage a comeback, Pat Buchanan? Uh, John, demographically, the Republicans are in very, very difficult shape because their constituencies, Christians, white folks, are diminishing as a share of the population and of the electorate. Secondly, far, far more of folks are basically getting benefits from the government and far fewer paying taxes. So they're in very bad shape in the long run. In the short run, I'm a lot more sanguine about 2010 for the simple reason that Republicans are united against Obama. There's a lot of energy <clears throat> and fire there, and a lot of what Obama is doing I think is very radical and very far out, and I think he could really implode this economy by 2010. Notice, John, in 66, Johnson got wiped out. Reagan got wiped out in 1982. Clinton got wiped out in 1994. The same thing could have happened to the, to the Democrats who right now I think are gloating a little bit too much. Donna Cliff. I don't think Democrats are gloating. They're just looking at the reality of what's happening to a Republican Party, which in the Washington Post ABC poll, uh, people who self-identify as Republicans is 21 percent. It's a really small slice of the electorate. And you have the party fighting within itself as to whether you want to purge all the people who don't uh, follow every one of the planks of the Republican Party or you want a big tent. And I do want to take this moment to uh, comment on the passing of Jack Kemp last weekend, who was the ultimate happy warrior, big tent conservative. Nobody could outdo him when it came to tax cutting or conservative ideas, but there was room in his Republican Party for other people, and he had a magnet, magnetic personality and put a happy face on, on, on conservative politics. The Conservative Party, Republican Party of today, they're just a bunch of scolds, and they're betting on mm -hmm. Obama failing, which mm -hmm. is like betting on the country failing. You've got to come up with an alternative vision that is an optimistic vision, and until they do that, they are toast. Uh, we join Eleanor in that salute to Jack Kemp. Absolutely. He was one of right nature's on. noblemen. Right he, on. Was, he had a yep. soul naturalita Christiana. He was naturally Christian. 
You didn't really need the religion. Okay, I mean, then. <laughs> if you understand me. Yeah, no, I, I get you. So anyway, getting back to the current Republican Party, they are in a very precarious position. The good news for the Republicans is that the United States does remain a center-right country. You do have 35% calling themselves conservative, a much lower number calling themselves Republicans and going with that party affiliation. But when you look on the issues, whether they're economic issues, issues of taxation, and even now some of the social issues, guns and abortion, there does seem to be a much more conservative trend happening. I think there are elements of uh, the Democratic Party having a problem coming up here that the Republicans, if they're smart and put together enough, might be able to capitalize, John. There's a providential opportunity for the Republicans to use their extreme minority status now to get their acts together and get back to first principles of limited government, controlling the size of government, and cutting taxes. Able. And if they're able to seize that, right. John, because of the over overreach by the Democrat in the White House and the Democrats in the Congress with this incredible spending happening. If the Republicans can really uh, get their, their scene together, they might be able to, to maximize their message the next time around. Uh, Martin, what do you think? Well, all parties, in a two-party system, all parties are coalition. And you can see certain signs of tension within the Democrats already. Uh, a lot of gays are becoming unhappy with Obama. Some of the left have been unhappy with his policies on Iraq and Afghanistan. But for the Republicans, this has been building up a long time. The Republicans have been very good at shooting themselves in the foot. They managed to destroy their hopes of winning a large portion of the Hispanic vote by their stance on immigration. They threw away their reputation for fiscal responsibility with earmarks and spending like drunken sailors under Tom DeLay in Congress. And the Republicans no longer seem to know what they really stand for. Are they the party of social conservatism? Are they the party of fiscal conservatism? And they've been, I think, Pat's absolutely right. They've been put on the defensive by the ability um, of Obama to build a broader base Democratic Party. Uh, it seems to me here at the group we're putting the onus on the Republicans to perform. Mm -hmm. What about Obama stumbling? Are there signs of stumbling <laughs> already? Look at the uh, national debt. What is the national debt now? About thirteen trillion dollars? Not, not trillion? quite there, but it's headed in it's that direction. Yeah. What, what is what the is deficit it? is two trillion dollars, I believe, this year. Do you think that Americans are comfortable with that prospect? It depends, yeah. John. They'll take anything in terms of a deficit. If the economy is rolling and it's going well, they won't worry about the deficit. But if things are going badly, this will scare the daylights out. Do they want less spending Later. today? I think Martin well. Martin believes, and I agree with him, that we're going to hit a really bad patch of inflation because of yeah. all this right. money well, that that's been means, put out of it. That means there will be no economic yeah. resurrection in the year 2012. 2012, unless, he, right. unless, he has, unless yeah. he's on the road to recovery, he, could, he becomes vulnerable, does he not? There's yeah. a big moment to wait for this year when Congress is going to have to vote to raise the debt limit above the current $12.5 right. When that moment comes, when that vote takes place, that is when this fear of debt, mm -hmm. the scale of the debt, but almost 100 percent of GDP. That is when it's going to become is a that really hot political issue. already that that scale of the GDP. Yes, yes it's already yeah. it's going to be it's going to be by next year it'll be 100 percent of GDP. Look, it's, so, it's so huge. all of that could happen. The, the election probably turns on whether or not we're in a state of recovery, real recovery. Sustained uh, recovery. Well, sustained the recovery. Listen, we're going to get a recovery the, because the amount of deficit spending taking place, a corpse yeah. would sit up. Okay, enter Huntsman. I think we've got some very good candidates, uh, John Huntsman. Obama's campaign manager was David Plouffe. This week, Plouffe said, quote, I think the person, the one person in that party who might be a potential presidential candidate is Governor John Huntsman of Utah, unquote. Huntsman is the 2012, 2012 Republican presidential buzz du jour. Here he is in Kalamazoo this week. We've got to get beyond just the gratuitous uh, uh, p political carping and get on to real bold solutions and real ideas like health care, like energy, like the environment, like economic development, like housing. John uh, Huntsman, Republican governor of Utah, 49 years of age, wife, Mary Case, seven children, two adopted daughters, one from China, one from India, religion Mormon, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Father John Huntsman Sr., nine children, special assistant to President Richard Nixon, founder Huntsman Petrochemical Corporation, a, billion, a billionaire. John Huntsman Jr., Wharton, BA, executive Huntsman uh, Chemical Corporation, 83 to 89. President Ronald Reagan, staff assistant, 82 to 83. U.S. Ambassador to Singapore, G.H.W. Bush, appointee, 92 to 93. 
youngest U.S. ambassador in a century, U.S. trade representative, deputy to George W. Bush, 01 to 03, state of Utah, governor, five years and currently term ends 2012. He will not opt for a third term. No Child Left Behind Act, he opposed it. Prescription drugs from Canada, okay. Civil unions for gays, okay. Generally, cut taxes, cut spending, cut government. That's his philosophy. The 2012 presidential bid, what do you say to that governor? I ask you. Pat. Uh, well, he's, uh, he's very well respected as a governor. <clears throat> I don't look on him as a, one of the top tier candidates, John. Because you start off in Iowa and New Hampshire and places like that. Iowa, if you're not socially conservative, you, you're writing off a third of the electorate out there. Secondly, he's a Mormon, but the Mormon who's really going to have drive and energy in there is going to be Mitt Romney. I don't see him, and I don't see, frankly, I look at a political athlete. I mean, it's like Obama is, Jack Kennedy was, Ronald Reagan was. I haven't seen that in him, someone who's got the char charisma, the personality, energy, and fire to break out of a pack. I haven't Have seen it Have you seen him closely? Yeah. No, I, no, I don't think anybody knows who no. he is. In fact, Pat had to put on his glasses to watch, watch him on the screen here to get a good look at him. Uh, he, right. he, he's, he's a mystery. Too. Why did Kloof uh, mention his name? Was that a red herring? No, no, To get no, the Republicans no, no, after the herring? But, no, he's, <laughs> get, he's getting attention because he is an unconventional Republican. He, has, he was early out of the box chiding his party after the election. He's talking about uh, being more inclusive. He's uh, supporting civil unions. Uh, and Pat may be right that he may not be able to navigate. Uh, Navigate the conservative social policies of close, the Republican can, primary election. We can take a look at him in a bite that I'm going to call up in a minute, which uh, I could have played earlier. Go ahead. You'll recall, maybe David Plouffe was watching our end of the year show, because the end of the year show last year, I identified Governor Huntsman as was the rising own, star Was in the he Republican your only designee party. in that category? Uh, I think he was, I think memory he was. serves, yeah. Because, listen, I think he's actually playing his cards him? right by not wanting to, to burn the candle at both ends so early before the presidential race. He's stepping back. He's letting Sarah Palin, Bobby Jindal take some of the early incoming fire here. And he's establishing himself as a real solid conservative. And Pat, I think that, that maybe in 2012, 2011, as the race really gets started, that maybe some of the traditional dynamics that have gone on in Iowa, mm -hmm. New Hampshire, they may not necessarily come into play this time around. And when you look at Huntsman, he's got all of the conservative credentials, good looking guy, right. personal money. Right. Right. And I think, and, and all the social issues might be more progressive, and that might actually play a little uh, bit better. Governor, Governor Huntsman, we ask you, sir, what will you do in uh, 2012? Will you run for president? It would be presumptuous for anybody to leap to any conclusions like that, in my case as well. Uh, question on the problem. That's the governor calling me now. He wants to correct the record. <laughs> <laughs> probability scale, zero to ten. Zero meaning zero probability. Ten meaning metaphysical certitude. What's the probability of John Huntsman winning the Republican nomination in 2012? Pat. Right now, I, I wouldn't even give him a one. I'd give him a half of one percent. Hello. Oh, I'd give him a three or a four simply because he's something new. And, uh, you know, whether Mitt Romney is in there again, we've seen him before, and I think he might have the uh, advantage of, of freshness. Mm -hmm. Did you see what Krugman wrote in the New York Times about how long this is going to last? Yeah, and I agree with it. Too. If it lasts that long, this might be a setup for, uh, well, yeah, set for well, the governor. You yeah, notice yeah, the, the, the thing about Huntsman, <laughs> this is the most internationalist candidate that the Republicans could have. He knows the world. He knows global economy. He really understands world trade. Because of that, I think he could be somebody with a different kind of agenda for Republicans. I'll give him a four. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think he's very clever to fly under the radar this early. He does have the foreign policy credentials, yep. former ambassador. He does know the world. Watch him. Watch him carefully. He might not get the Republican presidential nomination, but he might be the vice presidential pick. And he's got a lot of friends oh who would lead the ticket. No way. Who would lead the ticket? Who would lead the ticket? That's unclear. I, I, I think he had a bad That's very unclear. Didn't he introduce uh, uh, Sarah Palin at the convention? Uh, no, I, someone else introduced no. did he Did he make a speech in her uh, regard? Nobody needed to make a speech in her regard, John. <laughs> Look, I think it's right now it is Huckabee, Palin, Romney, and frankly, Newt, although Newt obviously carries a lot of baggage with him. You, they're very, very big figures, and you 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 got to have some way to break through and knock them off, you, and I don't a, see that. And, 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 you think right he's got now, the fire in the uh, belly? Right? He does, you know, we, who's got the most, the most fire in the belly? Newt Gingrich? Yeah. Mitt Romney. <laughs> 
Certainly Mitt does. Romney, yeah. definitely. Huckabee's yeah, got, got the divine fire in him. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, when you talk about the Republicans uh, recrafting their brand and, and recrafting and their image, it's got to be sold by a And right now, character. aside from this small group, I don't think people are focused on who's going to be the Republican <laughs> well, candidate in 2012. Tell that, to, tell that to Ploof, your friend Ploof. It's Ploof, John, David Ploof. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> really? And yes. don't forget McCain. He's very close right. to McCain. McCain still carries a lot of weight in the Republican Party. I don't know about I'm that this sure thong that or OU. <laughs> I mean, what, what's the justification of trans, transferring that into a, a short U up, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Issue two, quantum of solace. We are hopeful that the very sharp decline we saw will moderate considerably uh, in the near term and that we'll see positive growth by the end of the year. Indicators look better. So says the nation's foremost authority on the national economy, chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, Ben Bernanke. The, the biggest positive indicator is consumer spending. A whopping 70% of our $14 trillion gross domestic product. Here's Ben on that. Consumer spending, which dropped sharply in the second half of last year, grew in the first quarter. Another big indicator, the housing market. It's turning. Home sales are up. Mortgage rates down. The housing market, which has been in decline for three years, has also shown some signs of bottoming. A third diagnostic, credit. Banks are lending to each other again. Mutual trust among banks is coming back, though consumer lending remains tight. Not all the financial news is upbeat. Unemployment, now 8.5%, and will go up before it goes down, says Bernanke. But he adds it won't hit double digits. Business investment is, quote, extremely weak. Commercial real estate, not residential, still poor. So, to recap, the good news. Consumer spending up. Home sales up. Bank-to-bank -bank lending up. The ungood. Job losses still mounting. Business investment weak. Consumer lending weak. Commercial real estate weak. Update. The Treasury Department distributed bank stress tests to 19 U.S. banks. The tests show... They've been returned where the banks have enough money to withstand a future sudden downdraft in the economy. These banks' press tests came back mostly good. Update number two. The unemployment rate climbed four-tenths of a percent. It's now at 8.9. Bernanke said it will not hit the double digits. Question. Ben Bernanke, this nation's foremost authority in the economy, radiates knowledge, radiates integrity, he says the end is on the horizon. Is he right, or is this merely the calm before another storm? I ask you, Eleanor. Well, he is talking about the little green shoots and the glimmers of hope, and I think he's, he's on the same message as the administration, sort of focusing on some of the little mo moments of optimism that, w that we see. Uh, you, I don't you're think downplaying any, I, I don't, the optimism, aren't I you? don't think anybody really knows, but we, 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 I think we're beginning to find the bottom. The number of new claims for unemployment was the lowest it's been in several months, but there's still a record number of people drawing uh, unemployment insurance. But uh, we're not in the same free fall that we were earlier this year. So they may, you know, we may be stabilizing. Yeah, that's a big statistic because if you're unemployed, you're not buying. If you're sure. not buying, right. mm -hmm. which is 70% uh, is consumer demand related John, to the GDP the, per capita. John, the, um, the unemployment is a lag indicator. I mean, in other words, it follows the economy, but the stock market is... Is that lead. bad news or good news? No, it's good news in a sense because the stock market is a lead indicator and it's had a boom in... Uh, in, in eight March and April, very big boom. However, my view is, obviously, with all this money out there, all this spending, I think the economy is going to start going up, and everybody's going to feel good. We're going to get, uh, we're going to get the adrenaline. We're going to get a big push. But and it's good. And I think then, I think there's so much money. I think inflation is going to ignite. People abroad are going to want more, when? more when? Higher, higher interest rates for our bonds. Which when are before be 2012? Oh yeah, I yeah. think before 2010. Yeah. That'll yeah. kill Obama. <laughs> <laughs> It'll kill Obama. You know, you, this, you, you, whole, you are so... The whole, what, 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 the whole question here is whether, is whether the boom that we're going to get or the recovery we're going to get with all the deficit spending, whether it's sustainable. Look, we've got $2.5 trillion being put in by the U.S. government, the Europeans, the Chinese government to get this global economy moving again. That would make a corpse sit up.
Now, but it's not going to last. And the reason it's going to last is three. First of all, we haven't fixed the banks. Secondly, you can't trust the Chinese numbers. They're not growing nearly as much as they say they are. Thirdly, you've got 60% of the global economy, Europe, the US, Japan, all of them in sharp decline this year. So you, this is not going to be a sustainable you, recovery. Well, you think this all, is going to have political payoff? I ask you, well, I ask you, yeah, Monica. Uh, let well, Monica in here. Do you think this is going to have political payoff in the midterm elections next year in the Congress? It, it depends where we are in this recovery, and this might just be a short-term burst, and again, not a sustainable one. You mentioned the unemployment rates. Listen, that does have a cascading effect. You're going to have a second wave of credit card default, auto loan defaults that are going to come home to roost. As you mentioned the commercial real estate market there's 400 billion dollars in outstanding commercial real estate loans coming due before the end of the year yeah. you're going to see that crater as well look and i also think you guys are in overdrive excuse me hang on overdrive the overdrive you're going to ship the gears <laughs> now right overdrive trying to find the bad news for obama and the good news trying for the to well, there's bad news around here someplace. Where is it? <laughs> We're looking for it. I know you are. And inflation, there is no inflation. I know it. The, the stock seniors, market is up. I agree with you. The, yes. Yeah, but you're you all just, worried uh, about it. You oh, just oh, wait for oh, the inflation. Okay, question. The One word. is aren't the, even getting their cost of living uh, adjustment the, because there's no inflation. Is the economy going to be up or down in next year's election in November? Well, the economy will be up, but I think you'll see inflation by next November. We'll be in recovery, but the party in power typically loses seats, but the Democrats will gain in the Senate. You're seeing the same type of thing that got us into this mess. Massive borrowing, massive spending, and it's going to recycle itself. We're, it'll be a false dawn before we get a double-dip recession. I'll go along with that. I think the, the economy will be in neutral. It'll be idling. Issue three, Obama's foreign policy. We meet today as three sovereign nations joined by a common goal, to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat al-Qaeda and its extremist allies in Pakistan and Afghanistan. President Obama did what he does best this week, mediate, deal, compromise shrewdly, reconcile. Three heads of state involved this week were himself, Hamid Karzai, president of Afghanistan, and Asif Ali Zandari, president of Pakistan and widower of the assassinated Benazir Bhutto. Zandari and Karzai are long-standing rivals of each other. They blame each other for violence in the territory where Afghanistan joins Pakistan. Obama himself has been publicly critical of Karzai. He's particularly frustrated with Karzai's inability to stop the Afghanistan heroin trade that has funded the Taliban. Karzai's view of their relationship, however, remains upbeat. We've had ups and downs, especially in the past year and a half, in our relations with America. That the fundamentals of this relationship are very, very strong. As bad as Afghanistan has become, Pakistan is believed to be the greater concern of the free world. The Taliban is continuing to seize Pakistani territory. They're fighting for it either because they misunderstand the nature of the American presence or they have grievances against the government or they just want to carry an AK-47 around with them. But a Taliban takeover is unlikely, you know, says Pakistan's president. They have a 700,000 army. How could they take over? Question, can Obama succeed in stabilizing Afghanistan without destabilizing Pakistan, Martin. Well, he, first of all, he won't succeed in stabilizing Afghanistan. No empire has since Alexander the Great. Secondly... Stabilizing doesn't mean winning. It's stabilizing means stabilizing. It won't, it won't even stabilize. We've got 30,000 troops there? Not enough. Yeah. And, secondly, Afghanistan, and secondly, Pakistan already is destabilized. Pakistan is an amalgam of Baluchis, Punjabis, Sindhis, and Pashtuns. The, the, there's a kind of an incipient civil war on underway. Just last week, something like 30 uh, Pashtuns were gunned down in, a, in, a, in an ethnic battle in Karachi, the main pork city. The real problem is that for all of the, all of the promises that, uh, and all of the claims that, that Obama made after this meeting in Washington, the big thing he wanted from the Pakistanis he didn't get. They refused to shift any of their troops, right. a 700,000 man army, from the Indian border into where it really matters, John, that the swap The center of gravity had, and, and over there has shifted to Pakistan. It's Not, right on the border, yeah. It's, yeah, but the center of gravity is this nuclear, this is a nuclear state, 100 warheads. Yep. 
Now, do you have any knowledge of whether or not the security of that is impregnable? Well, I know that the Pakistanis called in the British, the American, some other military attaches about 10 days ago to give them some assurances about the warheads being placed well away from Taliban areas, about the warheads being, uh, being secure. Certainly they've got some American technology on safety and security of those warheads. Nobody really knows where they are. And one thing I think we can guarantee is that at least three nuclear armed countries, India, the USA and Israel have got pretty robust contingency uh, plans many should, years they, ago, should those bombs fall right. into danger. Many years ago, Zia told me that those nuclear bombs and where they are housed is impregnable. Right. Impregnable. Nothing, nothing the is the impregnable. Nothing. All nuclear weapons are kept <laughs> separate. Look, there's 66,000 Americans in Afghanistan are headed there, but the Taliban are still resurgent. It's a real problem. There's a reason why the Pakistani army does not want to fight the Taliban. Two reasons. One is they still see India as the main threat. Sure. Secondly, the privates and lower, lower enlistees in the Pakistani army come out of the same madrasas as those kids out there right. who are with the Taliban. They don't want to kill their own people. Uh, uh, you're almost squeezed out. You are, too. Can you give me well, five seconds? Uh, well, uh, Pakistan is potentially the biggest uh, threat to this country biggest since the threat cold, biggest nuclear threat. Biggest threats, challenge to biggest Obama. Biggest nuclear threat since the Cold War. And, and it's very close to being a, an absolute cataclysm. The Pakistani military is shot through with Islamist sympathizers, as is the ISI. Force prediction. Zippy Lidney will be Prime Minister of Israel by Easter of next year. Yes not or no? A, not a snowball's chance. <laughs> Why not? No. 50-50. Answer yes. Bye-bye. If, for such a small word, it packs a wallop. If I live to a hundred. If social security isn't enough. If my heart gets broken. If she says yes. We believe if should never hold you back. If should be managed with a plan that builds on what you already have. Together, we can create a personal safety net. A launching pad for all those brilliant ifs in the middle of life. You can call on our expertise and get guarantees for the if in life. After all, we're MetLife. When you meet our people, understand their vision, the spirit of self-reliance, and legendary can-do attitude. It won't surprise you that so many world-class companies are proud to call Mississippi home. Visit Mississippi.org to see what we can do for you.